spot. Um, I uh, have to play around here a little bit. I want to take you to nocturnal Berlin in the 1920s um, and for about half an hour, a little less, hopefully, and uh, talk about the astonishing discussion about Lichtreklame or Leuchtreklame, very intense debate about the illumination of architecture and luminous advertising, uh, just at the moment when Germany was slowly recovering from the devastating uh, First World War. Berlin was perhaps the most self-conscious of Europe's capitals in the 1920s, continuously concerned with uh, its status, its prestige and appearance, and the comparatively young German capital had recently become a city of more than 3 million inhabitants, thanks to an administrative uh, reorganization in 1920, uh, using a lot of, in incorporating a lot of small villages with uh, fields and gardens. And it was a huge uh, um, enterprise. And of course, to this very day, Berlin is the greenest uh, of the capitals in, uh, uh, in Europe. And uh, numerous articles wondered about the potential qualities that could truly characterize Berlin is not just a Großstadt, a big city, but a Weltstadt, a world city. That intense, uh, de um, this intense debate about future skyscrapers that you find in Berlin at the same time, uh, uh, for instance, in the 1920s, were driven as much by these ambitions as by jubilant reports about increased traffic, new power stations, and modern housing projects. Photo reports from London, Paris, and New York had long established the nocturnal appearance of a city as a central criterion for metropolitan qualities. But I want to go back just for one uh, second and sort of remind us that after the uh, First World War, the uh, uh, horrible uh, event of the First World War that Germany had begun and, and lost, and uh, um, the aftermath was a long economic crisis, uh, loss of land, of course, and uh, loss of millions of lives as well. Uh, in that sort of moment of a re, uh, org reorientation and a reckoning with uh, uh, Germany's history, expressionist architects such as Bruno Taut, the Luckert brothers, Hans Scherun and others had dreamt of a luminous architecture as a symbol for an entirely new beginning after World War I. Often these drawings, these structures were meant as temples of a denominational new religion. Even the cult of architecture uh, in, if you want, as uh, Brunetaut once put it, uh, um, um, their after effect, of course, was still palpable in the Bauhaus Manifesto, which talked about the cathedral of a new faith, and it lived on even in this sketch uh, for the Bauhaus in Dessau, where it is shown luminous and glowing, uh, surely not by Walter Gropius, who never did a single drawing uh, in his life, but one of his uh, collaborators. But I wanted to turn now, of course, to... Uh, the question of luminous um, advertising. In September 1924, the economic crisis uh, in Germany, just with a, uh, enormous inflation just over, uh, representatives of the German film and lighting industry invited lawmakers and businessmen to a movie theater on Potsdamer Platz in the heart of the city and showed them documentary films about New York City and London by night. This screening was part of an ongoing effort to ease restrictions and win support for more Lichtreklame, for more luminous advertising. All electric advertising had been switched off in 1916 during the, the war in Berlin and had been hesitantly reintroduced in 1921 and since then had made very little progress, partially due to restrictive regulations uh, limiting advertising to the first floor of all buildings. While the initiative sprang from the immediate business interests of the lighting and film industry, it was generally welcomed as addressing a widespread concern. The first palpable results after the initiative of 1924 were, were an enormous illuminated sign atop the uh, AEG building that you see here on the left, and that was the General Electric Company, so they immediately put something on their roof uh, before they could only have uh, electric advertising on the first floor. And the headquarter building here is fully illuminated in the facade, even was given a little lighthouse uh, um, at the top to make their presence known in the cityscape. Similarly, in 1925, um, the uh, company that ran the big power stations, Bebak, um, was also illuminated, uh, illuminated with a gigantic sign. Martin Wagner, finally, in 1926, became city councillor 
uh, for urban planning in Berlin and eased the restrictions. And immediately, many observers noted that the nocturnal Berlin seemed much more luminous. Lajos uh, um, Kasak, whom we've heard uh, about, uh, in fact, uh, pointed out that uh, luminous advertising was really uh, something uh, that uh, defined uh, Germany in the eyes of foreigners. The Lichtreklam of our big cities tells the visitor more and more objectively about us than the reactionary flood of words and the heaviest Badegger travel guide. Um, advertising is constructive art. To create advertising means to be a social artist, he said. A great statement of 1926, but of course, as you can imagine, when those restrictions were eased, that is not exactly what happened immediately. What happened were uh, sort of rather vulgar uh, um, events such as this advertising that you see here right on the rooftop of a building with which it has nothing to do really for a champagne that actually still exists in Germany, Kupferberg Gold. It's not expensive, it's a fairly uh, cheap uh, champagne and here's the advertising and uh, miraculously the drawings by Julius Gipkins uh, for it uh, have survived. And um, others pointed out uh, in fact um, that, uh, or there was an intense debate really about where advertising could uh, be taken. And one important point to be made was that more of it was needed. So this extensive debate that happens about advertising uh, in, Germany at the uh, in Germany at the time is really, in my eyes, one of the most remarkable and least known uh, architectural debates of the Weimar Republic. It soon went beyond luminous, luminous advertising to the role of artificial light as a new building material, design problems in the nocturnal city, different approaches in Germany and America, and finally, utopian visions of an immaterial, ephemeral um, architecture as the ultimate fulfillment of modernity. Numerous prominent representatives of modern architecture took part in those debates, among them Ernst May, you'll hear a little more about him in a moment, Ludwig Hilbersheimer, Hugo Hering, Marcel Breuer, Martin Wagner, and Arthur Korn, among others. In addition, of course, to journalists and critics and uh, representatives of the lighting industry. The fact that the debate uh, was first initiated by the lighting industry and then joined by avant-garde architects is symptomatic for the entire development uh, in this field. Progressive uh, young architects in Europe, mostly politically liberal, as you've heard uh, from Elias Kassak, welcomed the fast-paced life of the metropolis usually and its artistic potential as an expression of modernity. We already had heard about um, uh, uh, Ernst May, the uh, building deputy director in the city of Frankfurt, a modernist who started that journal that uh, Paul showed us, Das Neue Frankfurt. And in this Neue Frankfurt, he published an article in 1926 when the discussion really catches on that he calls um, Reklame Reform. We need a reform for advertising. And in it, he makes a few important points, namely that Reklame advertising should be organized so that they don't compete with each other and uh, outdo each other, um, and it should uh, and it should the uh, should be organized and limited. There should be rules and there should be uh, uh, experts that would in fact uh, decide what uh, gets uh, um, uh, put up onto buildings to bring a certain order into the appearance. Before I go a little further. Uh, in it, I just wanted to read uh, a quote from in the journal Deform, just to show you the widespread um, um, uh, discussion about this that came in 1926. And uh, I wanted to just look at this uh, again, which said, um, everybody knows photographs of New York here on the left and Paris. Well, there's great chaos during daytime. The wealth of luminous advertising provides an enchanted illumination at night. Where this is still lacking, we should hurry to catch up. The Potsdamer Platz in Berlin, here on the right, still has too much unformed darkness. And this is Edward uh, Gellhorn uh, speaking, and he said, there will be great tasks for architects, painters, illumination engineers, and there will be a chance to identify a German position. Instead of billboards in front of the windows, as in America, where you sell an entire facade and work behind it with artificial light, we can design facades that fulfill their original spatial purpose. So back to this uh, um, um, enterprise in Frankfurt, 
Hannes, uh, um, Ernst May rather, uh, needs, uh, says he needs reform and he uh, in fact describes in detail that uh, advertising needs to be regulated and sorted out. In the meantime, as you can see, uh, many uh, pieces of advertising had already reached the uh, rooftops of buildings which had not been allowed before. And so he hires uh, oops, sorry, this did not go as planned. He hires here we have him, Walter Dexel. And we heard a lot about Walter Dexel. Very, very interesting uh, figure in many ways. Of course, he knew Jan Schicholt. Here's a letter in the collection uh, between the two. And Walter Dexel was director of a museum in Jena, uh, where he organized a whole string of exhibitions, designed the posters for them, uh, very much interested in typography, in design, great lover of uh, this style. And he gets hired by Ernst May to bring order to do this reclame reform, the reform, the, the way advertising uh, comes about. And in a very interesting fashion, he gets to work. Here's a little bit of his uh, work in this context. You see here, uh, inspired by this style, he not only designed advertising for the streets of his hometown of Jena, but he also created abstract sculptures in this sort of Mondrian-esque uh, style. He was a very sort of practical uh, man. Here's another abstract sculpture. Uh, he was uh, very practical and he said, you know, we have so many um, um, unused uh, um, former gaslight supports that come out of the walls. Why don't we put electric advertising uh, um, uh, onto those? And you see here that old fashioned arm that is there. So you want to recycle those and uh, use them for modern advertising. You see here on the right is another one. This is obviously a 19th century device and he wanted to modernize them by advertising department stores or a drugstore, uh, a, a bookstore, etc. What is interesting is that he was quite dogmatic in his approach. Uh, as you can see, he used all caps always for his advertising, not like many Bauhaus members, uh, all lowercase, quite the opposite. And he wrote extensively about uh, minimizing the elements of advertising. He even defined the colors in different sides of these cubic sculptures that he imagined and was very uh, clear that uh, too much writing was uh, certainly uh, um, uh, sort of too much of a good thing, that he didn't want any images, for instance, and uh, reduce the notion of advertising generally to a very simple formal language. This actually caught on. Uh, at the Bauhaus, I found this uh, drawing in the Studio für Lichtreklame that was uh, instituted under Joost uh, Schmidt in 1927 to 28, where students very much in the style of... Uh, um, of this uh, Walter Dexel uh, did experiments for a newly regulated approach to advertising. And uh, Walter Dexel uh, went to work both in Jena and then in Frankfurt under Ernst May and created uh, street furniture. Uh, quite a number of it. Here's even one piece that was uh, built in um, Berlin. This is a uh, bus stop and the H is the beginning of the German word halt for Haltestelle. So the letter H becomes the sign of what it is, and then he designed these beautiful uh, phone booths that are covered in advertising based on a square. There's a little door there and you go inside combined with a, a clock at the top and very strictly regulated. Um, in this case, in the middle, the font that could be used by this washing powder that we still have in Germany. And on the right, at least he determined the size of the poster, he called it non placard, so there was a certain size that he suggested. So he wanted to regulate it as much as possible, and he went to work now in Frankfurt to, in fact, write a new reclame ordnung, uh, if you like, to suggest to all the businesses in the city that they should adhere to the rules that he set. He was wanted to regulate basically the impact of typography in the nocturnal landscape. It's really quite wonderful. There's a lot of writing going on and he was very clear. He didn't want any imagery, any ornaments. He didn't want what you see here in the background where every store had its own signet, but everything should be normalized. And as you can see here in his photo montage, he imagined that the uh, images uh, and the, the signs would all have to be the same size and all uh, be on mass of the same length. He wanted to prescribe to the business owners in Frankfurt 
uh, where on their building advertising could go. He made it very specific that when you get to the corner, you don't want anything sticking out because it would impede people's view into the next street and went into great detail. It's quite wonderful and in some ways not surprising perhaps then. It didn't um, uh, didn't uh, uh, find uh, much approval among the business community in Frankfurt. Uh, here is his essay "Reklame im Stadtbild," also of course published in Das Neue Frankfurt, where he showed a few of his already executed designs. I showed you one or two of them and uh, things that he approved of. For instance, uh, the Deuni uh, Cafe in Rotterdam by JJP Out, and the building I'll show you a little more about in a moment uh, by Arthur Korn that had been um, uh, remodeled. But what was important to him was to make reclame, advertising as simple as, possibly, uh, as possible typographically. And he suggested, and I think that might have been the uh, final straw for the business community of Frankfurt, why they rejected these uh, laws that he was trying to institute. Uh, he wanted to simplify things so much that instead of uh, much writing, he would have some signs that would indicate uh, where you would find what. So here on the left, for instance, is a, um, um, you know, a red cross for a place where you can get health. If you uh, go a little further, the next one would indicate that this was a doctor, a male doctor, and uh, the next one indicated it was a female doctor, and the third one, uh, someone who could help you to uh, give birth to your uh, baby, a Geburtshelfer. And the last one, as you, maybe you can guess, was the sign for uh, an eye doctor. So you see those two. So, so you want to simplify everything. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, ultimately, uh, what was meant to be a legal framework for all the businesses in Frankfurt was rejected. And Ernst May had to scale it down. And he um, issued some regulations, some suggestions. But it wasn't punishable by law anymore if you didn't apply these things as was as had originally been intended. Ernst May uh, very cleverly roped into this campaign of organizing the uh, typography in nocturnal Frankfurt um, um, a lot of prominent uh, writers and thinkers. I'm thinking of Adolf Behne, for instance, the great uh, prominent critic, perhaps the most prominent critic in Weimar Germany, very witty uh, man who wrote also in Das Neue Frankfurt Kultur, Kunst, und Reklame, culture, art, and advertising. And he said, one thing we always get wrong is that we try and bring art and advertising together. He said, they have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Advertising it adver is advertising, art is art, and don't mix them up. Just uh, do a good job uh, making advertising that announces a product and is visible. And uh, don't overthink it, basically. It's a wonderful, very uh, um, sort of joyful article. And of course, people would always talk about how America uh, had such a sort of overflow of uh, advertising and he sort of undermines that and says, let's look at some European advertising that is just as horrible, if not worse, than anything in America. <laughs> and uh, he goes to, uh, fi finds this example in Amsterdam. He says, look at this street corner. It's a terrible mix of different sizes and uh, you can't really concentrate on any of these advertisers. They kill each other. Uh, have different fonts, obviously, they cover the entire building. And then he says, now look how well the Americans do that. And looks at this building, at uh, this uh, image here. This is, of course, from uh, Eric Mendelssohn's book on America. And you see here, there's a certain sort of democracy. Every poster has its own space. They are lit at night, and uh, he uh, fully approves of it. And then he shows another image also to sort of undermine the expected uh, uh, idea about uh, America wh where he looks at this one and he says look at this uh, photograph here which has double uh, double exposure obviously and it shows us that if there were twice as many adverti advertisements in uh, Broadway it would still be very good even better than it is with just uh, you know one exposure and so uh, really quite witty uh, and Adolf being a really great uh, wonderful writer and he uh, in a way makes that point very strikingly this image too was taken from Eric Mendelssohn's The Architect's book uh, on America, who had traveled here, 24, um, come over here when it was possible for the first time after Germany's uh, crisis. And he um, had published, he had met on the boat um, a man called Fritz Lang, whom you see here. And uh, they had become friendly. Fritz Lang was going over to promote his latest movie, which was Die Nibelungen, a medieval uh, story, big success. 
and he was blown away by Broadway um, and uh, made some uh, notes there and I wanted to uh, read them to you and uh, he gave that photo that he took so Fritz Lang goes to Broadway and he writes about his impressions there uh, when he's in Times Square in 1924 he says the image of New York City by night would be sufficient as the centerpiece of a movie streets are abysses full of light of moving twirling circling light that is like a statement of happy life and sky high above cars and elevated trains skyscrapers emerge in blue and gold white and purple torn from the darkness of the night by powerful floodlights, uh, he says. And um, he then gives this photo uh, to Eric Mendelssohn to use in his book. But of course, this uh, impression also um, influenced his uh, uh, description of the future uh, city of Metropolis that he was then uh, doing as his next movie. And you can see how much advertising plays a role in this very complicated trick sequence that was shot image by image, 25 images for each second. And uh, it has sort of handwritten uh, uh, advertising, luminous advertising letters that go off and uh, on. And of course, the key moment then is, this is the moment when the uh, workers uh, uh, start, stage a revolt and uh, suddenly all the advertising uh, stops and the uh, evil um, John Frederson up in the tower observing everything realizes that something is wrong because the advertising doesn't work anymore and so a uh, very powerful message he is I, I know why it just stopped maybe you'll see the moment when uh, the advertising has sort of one last convulsion here it goes really fast and then uh, uh, John Frederson realizes uh, something is terribly wrong uh, underground and jumps up and then hears about the fate of his son doesn't seem to want to go there, but many of you have seen. Also, advertising, of course, was then very quickly uh, filmed and shown if a department store advertised as White Weeks, the Weisse Wochen, as they were, would often do with luminous signs uh, in the facade. And um, uh, a famous film is done about Berlin at exactly the same uh, time as Metropolis. This is uh, what you would see before the main film starts. This is a so-called Wochenschau that would introduce certain themes and show you aspects of your city of Berlin, perhaps, and often focus on uh, nocturnal imagery and advertising in the streets because they were seen as a sign, as I've uh, mentioned earlier, of being a world uh, global city. And so that was really important. And here is a short clip from uh, Berlin Symphony of a big city of the Großstadt. Uh, which, you know, contemporary critics such as Siegfried Krakow uh, described in great detail as they felt it was a little overdone, overemphasizing advertising and lighting and other aspects just to make Berlin look like a big city like London and New York and Paris, which of course it wasn't. It was a calm and green city in very few spots you would see as many lights as you see here. So it was one had to really try and uh, put this picture together. So all of this is debated uh, at the time, but I wanted to talk a little more about um, architecture um, and the impact of lighting uh, on the facades. And we have very good voices by contemporary critics of where they feel uh, things actually uh, did work out uh, in particular uh, fashion. And I'll show you one of the great examples that is always quoted is the department store by uh, Eric Mendelssohn, uh, where he had, uh, in fact, um, fought for a long time to be allowed to build higher than the environment. Everyone came to his support when the uh, building department didn't give him permission. Mies and others signed a letter uh, on his behalf, arguing that these higher buildings now uh, have, should not be seen in the context in which they are, exist now, but in the context of a future city, which, of course, would be quite different. And uh, he got a lot of very positive comments about how he integrated the writing and the advertising in his facade. Um, and um, he built so-called light cornices. And that is recognized here as a new element. What is important is that the uh, anticipation of the nocturnal appearance and the anticipation of writing in the facade determines the form of the architecture. So this ephemeral idea of advertising has a profound effect on the design of modern architecture. It leads to horizontality, to those ribbon windows, and uh, to this ephemeral appearance. In fact, uh, as uh, critics wrote here, Ernst May, in fact, he writes about this as a great example uh, from Berlin. He says, such light cornices in Erich Mendelssohn's 
uh, recent stores, which he found discreet and artistically of excellent appearance. Uh, in fact, they, uh, they uh, need reflecting surfaces of stuccoed walls, but otherwise are excellent examples. Or he mentions Mendelssohn's uh, Petersdorf store in Breslau, um, where the light is applied within the uh, window areas. And the next step, says my, is more expensive but highly effective panels of translucent glass lit from behind as in the luminous facade of the De Vollharding building um, in The Hague or um, other stores that he mentions. And he says, uh, advertising has become the most significant tool uh, for a nocturnal architecture that we should consider. And luminous facades became quite prominent and illuminated facades in Berlin. The city was called by the New York Times at the end of the 1920s, the best lighted city uh, in Europe. But of course, in most cases, um, the situation wasn't quite uh, so easy because the uh, uh, economy was still somewhat weak. And instead of building new buildings, and Berlin, of course, had been uh, fully built out in the center, uh, what was happening was, of course, modernization of existing buildings. And uh, the modernization of Berlin often came hand in hand with a simplification of the facade. If you look here, uh, for instance, this is a building from clearly the late 19th century. Arthur Korn, modernist architect, comes in and frees the facade of all of its uh, stucco ornament. And that happened throughout Berlin. Someone should really, it would be a great topic for a book because that is really what's happening in 1920s Berlin uh, to many, many buildings. I'll show you one other in a second. And so as the sequence goes in an article by Hugo Herring, as the sequence uh, uh, goes, um, in fact, um, the night lighting is really completing the picture. And now the light from this vertical uh, fluorescent light can really stream on both sides of the facade. And one author, in fact, said we're on our way to a completely ephemeral architecture by putting a, uh, an image here of a recent uh, light sculpture uh, there. So um, really quite uh, interesting how everyone at that moment realizes that there is a new uh, art form in the making. I wanted to show you one other example, which I always found really striking. I did a little research on it. Here's a building at Berlin's most, in West Berlin's most prominent intersection, Unter den Linden and Joachimsthaler Straße. Here's a building of 1887. That's first apartments, then becomes a business. Uh, and uh, uh, an architect puts in horizontal bands so that advertising and lighting can be introduced. So it looks like this here. Uh, and you still see the historicist facade in the background and writing is introduced, but then 1927, the process continues and the uh, upper half is modernized even more. All the stucco is taken away so that in fact, horizontal bands of writing can be applied here. And uh, finally, then the architect uh, Otto Fierle comes in and provides uh, um, fluorescent lights over a facade that has been completely scrubbed of all of, of all of its ornamentation and turned into something entirely different, a sort of modernist pastiche, a very strange uh, appearant, appearance, and that happened a lot in Berlin. Ritzler, uh, one of the prominent critics at the time, uh, in fact, uh, talks about it and says, the fact that the redesign of facades has become a serious architectural task is not without fundamental implications. It seems to contradict all principles of sound architecture. But it also proves that in the continuum of an urban street, the facade has become distinct from the structure behind it, so it can be treated independently. And uh, an important here is just a, a look where you see that uh, uh, store, Grünfeld store, in the distance. Very important voice um, in, this, um, um, in this debate was a man called Ludwig Hilbersheimer, who writes about the new uh, business street very evocatively suggesting, in fact, uh, that this is part of a process that will go even further. And he looks at the different streets at night, and he basically declares in his uh, final statement here, and I just translate very quickly, the modern business uh, house has no architectural facade in the old sense anymore. Its outer skin is only the scaffolding for advertising of all kinds. And this does not mean that uh, instead of the old architecture, now we should have uh, advertising architecture. He wanted it to be open to all kinds of advertising that could change and be applied. So he completely dissolves architecture and suggests this is the new way uh, to go. And of course, he shows as a prime example uh, the building here on the right by his old friend, 
uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. And so I just want to spend uh, three more minutes on uh, Mies, uh, who, by the way, knew Dexel uh, very well. Uh, Dexel had invited him to curate an exhibition in 1924, which Mies did. This is that beautiful, you showed it, uh, Paul, the beautiful invitation there. And uh, as you can see, it's a very interesting Mies who had just been in the Gropius's, uh, Gropius's International Architecture Show, which he uh, told in confidence to some friends he absolutely hated. He had been part of it, but he said it was too constructivist and there was intellectual fog that he didn't uh, uh, enjoy. And so he puts his own show together and invites much broader range of people, Hans Pölzig and his teacher, Peter Behrens, and so broadens the understanding of modern architecture. And it's quite uh, nice to see that there's both serif and sans serif sort of modern and less modern uh, typeface there. They also had, Dexel liked him so much that he asked him to, to design a house for him, which Mies got as far as these sketches, and Dexel was very uh, impatient with him and said, can you give me something next week because I'm having dinner with my father-in-law and he's going to pay for it. Yeah. And uh, Mies was a very slow worker and did not like to be pushed, and that's all he delivered. And uh, Dexel, there are all these wonderful letters from Dexel to Mies over the next months. Can you please... Uh, design something because the father-in-law is not going to wait any longer. And so uh, famous affair Dexel in Mies' uh, oeuvre never came about. Of course, uh, Mies just uh, completely uh, shut him off. But it laid the groundwork for Mies' first modern building, the Wolfhaus in Guben, uh, which unfortunately was destroyed after the war. There's a little group to which I belong who wants to rebuild it now. It's in Poland. And uh, we're uh, gaining a little traction with that project. But what I wanted to talk about just for another minute is that Mies has, as you all know, of course, designed in 1922 this glass skyscraper with which his friend uh, Hilbesheimer immediately described as 100% light architecture, so as if it was meant to be luminous. We don't know, of course, how Mies imagined it to be at night, but we can very well imagine that nothing came of the project or of the whole competition uh, to which it was late submitted. But uh, what was interesting is the triangular plot of land in the center of Berlin was used by a beer hall, which uh, in fact, at is, as its advertising tower, used this wonderful luminous stele on which then uh, writing uh, could, be, um, could be applied. And uh, this is uh, obviously something that we can imagine Mises building might have looked like uh, at night. And it also laid the groundwork for a design that Mies uh, did that you just saw briefly at a department store for David uh, Saul Adam at the prominent intersection of uh, Unter den Linden and Friedrichstraße. Here's the model and here's the drawing. And it was meant to be luminous at night and certainly influenced by the luminous Bauhaus. I just want to point out one little thing, which I, when I was putting uh, this together, I read uh, Mocha Efti uh, here. And I don't know uh, how many of you are familiar with that term. This was a famous coffee house by a Greek man in Berlin at exactly that corner across the street. Uh, and it uh, plays a major role in uh, Babylon Berlin that some of you might actually uh, have seen. So I, I couldn't help myself. I put in this image here. Mocha Efti is a major uh, place of action there. And the Uli Hanisch, the great set designer, put it actually at that intersection. So across the street would have been Mises' design here and turned it into a luminous uh, facade uh, as well. And uh, um, the uh, uh, design by Mies... I just wanted to uh, point this out. Um, uh, I sort of played with it a little bit. It's very nice to imagine it uh, at night here uh, in this, uh, at this intersection across from uh, Mokka FD, uh, where uh, in fact the light, I just, if you see the green light just went on here. And so now I imagine it uh, in, at night. Mies van der Rohe, in fact, wrote to Mr. Adam when he proposed this uh, design uh, he said, um, uh, Mr. Adam, I suggest you making the skin of your building of glass and stainless steel with the bottom floor of transparent glass, the others of opaque glass. Walls of opaque glass give the rooms a wonderfully mild but bright and even illumination. In the evening, it represents a powerful body of light and you have no difficulties in uh, fixing advertising. So exactly what uh, Hilbersheimer had suggested. You can do as you like, regardless whether you write on it for the summer vacation, for winter sports, or for bargain days. Such a brightly lit advertising on an evenly illuminated background will have a fairy tale effect. 
for the back walls of the display windows too, I would recommend colored mirror glass and that in mouse gray. Your building should bear the character of your business and should fit in with the modern time and with people that embody it. So this was uh, Mises' design. As you know, it was an executed. The Adams left Berlin when the Nazis uh, came to power. Ken Adam, the owner, the son of the owner, became a famous uh, uh, set designer for all the James Bond movies. Uh, but of course, then the Nazis uh, came uh, to power and uh, uh, immediately made it clear that they hated the whole idea of uh, luminous advertising. Uh, uh, in fact, um, as uh, Goebbels wrote, the heart turns to stone of this city, the eternal repetition, uh, talking about advertising, of corruption and decay, of inner emptiness and despair, he felt was uh, represented here. And so uh, he went on saying, millions are unhappy with the way in which exterior advertising spreads. A new law for exterior advertising has to be based on the national socialist Realistic worldview, which holds decisive points of view towards questions of both economy and production and the protection of our heritage. Any continuous exterior advertising is simply contrary to the state's philosophy. In reality, however, the Nazis realized very quickly that advertising was something they couldn't suppress, that it also enhanced the sort of worldly look and very little of the city and of the state and very little uh, actually changed under them. Um, I uh, wanted to end as a sort of very brief epilogue with this building here, which uh, was a department store at Hermannplatz, uh, which used uh, lighting without writing, without uh, typography, but so with very little typography, let's say, but so iconic in its setback uh, illumination, very much reference to what was happening in America and beautiful outline lighting, that that was really embraced as one of the most successful uh, applications of light architecture. I noticed in uh, Berlin, Babylon is also uh, where it's under construction, 1929. Uh, is a scene where they very nicely uh, rebuilt the uh, uh, site. It was destroyed in the war and rebuilt in this very unattractive and uninteresting form here on the uh, lower right. And just last week, uh, a decision was made to rebuild the entire thing. David Chipperfield is going to the, be the architect. Uh, there will be a roof garden, and he promised to bring the lighting back as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.